guys. Oh. I can remember being in a Ferrari 575 Maranello on the south coast of France. And, and the main thing that I cared about was that I had to try and get one more baby bell into my mouth. Once in Italy and once into a bus stop uh, in Swindon. So it was daft to imagine that I could do that and not end up upside down in a ditch, which is where I ended up. Hello, and welcome to the Collecting Addicts podcast, episode number 45. You'll notice Manish sadly can't be with us because he's a very busy chap, but we'll carry on in his spirit. The podcast will be slightly less lucid and slightly less classical without him. But we'll, we will make an homage to him at the end. Don't worry, we've got him covered. Uh, you'll see myself and Edward sporting a pair of very exclusive twat sunglasses, which will soon be available for sale somewhere. I don't know where, uh, but they are, of course, by... The dark web, probably. Yeah. <laughs> by me, Chris Harris. They're made in a Chinese sweatshop and they're suitably horrible. Um, everyone's a bit coldy and a bit Christmassy because everyone gets it at this time of year. So if we all sound a bit bunged up and lem sippy, we apologise. But we're here to entertain. And we're going to do yeah. that the first subject, which is, what's the daftest thing you've done in a car? Now, I really like this one because it, it reminds me of a word that I love. Daft is a great word. It's not used enough because most people resort to the vernacular or stupid or you're an arse. But when you were young, your ch- your parents would say, don't be daft. And daft, for me, suggests a slightly childish silliness. It's not yes. about being outrageous. It's a childish silliness. Yes. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to the daftest child among us, Edward Lovett. Oh, <laughs> I think I've told a few of these stories. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure if I've ever said this before, but... I've crashed a couple of cars. No! <laughs> I want to say it was, for me, the daftest thing is the intrigue and discovery of the Manatino. <laughs> and oh. I think yeah. if the Manatino was mounted on the other side of a Ferrari steering wheel... I would have had less costly issues in my motoring career. That's but it really... wasn't. It, it was there. It's right in front of you. It says, twist me. Go all the way to the end. Go on. <laughs> Go one more. Ice it's is dark. not cool. <laughs> and um, clearly, as a total dick that I am, or twat, um, I always have to do it whilst there's someone behind me I want to try and impress. <laughs> when so you say behind all, you. So, so I can never say that, like, I, I can never hide the fact it happened. There was there was always an audience, which makes my, <laughs> it makes life so much more embarrassing. Once in Italy and once into a bus stop uh, in Swindon. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that well, I, see, I would say those are stupidity and not daft, but I'm going to go to Chris Cooper, who's going to give an example of daft. So I've got some more, but I'll come back to them. <laughs> I, it, it was daft that I thought when I was 17 that my mother had a Fiat 126. And when my mother and father used to go out and leave the Fiat 126 and the keys to Fiat 126 about the house, we had a field where I grew up in Kent. And it was daft to imagine that we could do skids and like a figure of eight oversteery handbrake turn. It was daft to think we could do that and they wouldn't notice. Because funnily enough, when you look from the upstairs window, all he could see was this figure of eight skiddage in the field. We tried disguising it by cutting the grass a lot. And it was daft to imagine that they wouldn't notice that. Why has the lawnmower got no petrol in it? Why has the lawnmower been used so much? And why is it only in the field, not in the front gardens? That was pretty daft. Um, and Fiat 126, actually, I think is. It's a lovely car. It's, it's a lovely. Well, it was a center of gravity of daft because when it was. Because it used to snow a lot when Neil and I were younger. And you go out in the winter 
And you'd think, and I lived in Kent, rural Kent, when I was growing up, and there's lots of little country lanes. And you think, how would you get the car to oversteer? I've seen oversteer. I've no idea what it is, but it looks quite fun. I've seen rallyists doing it. So I realised that you could get the car to oversteer by turning into a corner, and that would just push on. I think, that just, that's just boring. You end up in a tree. But if you turn in and then dump the clutch, push it down, lift it up again, that sort of, it seems to do something helpful. It makes car... So it was daft to imagine that I could do that and not end up upside down in a ditch, which is where yeah. I ended up, thinking <laughs> this rear-engined with a wheelbase of about three inches, when you lock the rear axle, this rear-engine, rear-weight thing wouldn't just go backwards into a ditch and obviously just turn over upside down. And it was daft to imagine that we could push it back onto its wheels without anybody finding. But I think the daftest thing I've done, because it's sort of like... What were you thinking? It wasn't, I wasn't trying to be clever. It was, I'm sure I've told you about this before, Monkey. It was, I was driving back from Germany when we'd done a track day at the ring at the end of our one of our VLN seasons. And Guy Spur was in that 997 GT3 RS. Remember that one he had? Yeah. We were all very jealous of that. Yeah. And he and I were driving back. I was in my M6. V10, mm, which was a lovely car on the road, horrific on the track. And we're driving through Belgium, and I had one of those sort of fat face type rugby shirt things on. So they're not stretchy like a rugby shirt. They're quite uh, cotton. Is this a trying to take it off in the car story? Yes. Right. Because it, yes. they're, quite, they're, they're not very givey. You think a rugby shirt would have and a, and a jersey would have like stretchy giviness to it. And you could sort of like take one arm out and then take the other arm out. So you have your hands back <coughs> on the wheel. And with the last the last movement, you could reach over your head and grab the edge of the sweater and go, voila. That didn't work with the fat face. Other non-stretchy rugby shirts are available, but this one was a fat face, I think. I got stuck. I got it stuck with one arm out, the other arm in, and it was up to about here. And I couldn't get it back on again, and I couldn't get it off. And I was there must have been, it felt like the rest of time, and I was stuck there. I, I've never been so scared in a car. I've never been so scared in a there car. Are lots of, there are lots of stats around how many accidents are actually caused by sneezing, uh, you know, as in yeah. a huge number of accidents. But I, I reckon this, the bloke trying to get a jumper off or a gillet or whatever they're wearing, yeah. I mean, yeah. it just seems so, so obvious. It's a, it's a bit hot. I thought actually, it's a bit heavy. I'd like to feel a little bit more relaxed in the car. So I'll just, I won't stop. I mean, why would you stop? Mm. Jesus Christ! How? You do, but how you think daft, how? How is this possible? How daft could you be? I'd like to think I'm a reasonably sensible grown-up bloke, but I thought this is a perfectly normal sense thing to do. So I got stuck, and I've never. I thought I've never been even racing at the ring or spa in the chucking rain where you can't see anything. That wasn't as scary as being stuck in daftitude with my sweatshirt. So the daftest thing I've ever done in the car is thinking it was okay, kids, to try and take a non-stretchy upper body garment off in a moving motor vehicle on a German autobahn at 180 kilometers an hour or something. And That's it wouldn't very go daft. On. How I got away with it. I always think, what would they... Don't do this at home. When they do the post-mortem, what would they think I was doing? I mean... They, they think I had a problem. Just... No, Clifford, no, Clifford, you strike me as someone that, despite your impish sense of humour, isn't that up to doing daft things in cars? Because actually, you buy such daft cars, you don't even need to uh, to be daft, do you? But I am. <laughs> Good. Save me. Often. I think that the... the, the I, ha I have a number of man crushes. I think we all have man crushes. And one of them, most of us know this man, is this gorgeous Italian called Massimo. And Massimo is the most sophisticated, good-looking, stylish, gorgeous Italian man. Like most you... Itali Italian men. Does he and know you think he... this? Yes, I've told him. Uh, uh, he, I, I have a league of man crushes, and he's number, he's number three. Ooh. We'll discuss the other two later. And uh, he said That's to one me, of us unlucky. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, he said to me, "You know what, Neil? I've got I've got tickets to the AC Milan Inter Milan derby at the San Siro, San Siro. On, on Saturday night. I've never been to the San Siro, and of course, going with him would be beautiful because the seats would be lovely. It's ninety thousand gorgeous men with beautiful hair and beards dressed in navy blue, and I thought, fuck it, I'm going to go to that. And it was a Saturday night, and I thought, okay, well, it'd be fine. I'll just drive there." So I jumped in uh, 997 GT3 RS and I left I left my house at sort of 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning and drove all the way to Milan and got there at about six o'clock, parked at the hotel car park, went and met Massimo with amongst his other gorgeous, lovely, navy blue, beautifully trimmed friends. And we went to the game, and it was a beautiful game. And I thought, oh, my God, I can't believe I've never been to the San Siro. And, I've, you know, we got a lift back. Um, there was there was a rather more in this Lamborghini Urus that was legal. But anyway, they, they took us back in a Lam- his friend in a Lamborghini Urus back to my hotel for, for, to get to bed. And I thought, you know what? I'm not tired. And it was a Saturday night, and I thought I'd love to get no. home for a, ro- no. for a roast. Di- I'd love to get home for a roast dinner. This would be nice. I surprised the wife. I'm going to drive back. At this point, it was about half past eleven at night in Milan. I'd just driven there, and I jumped in the GT3 RS and drove back. And uh, of course, I-, I had a Red Bull and a couple of espressos, and I was feeling very sophisticated and adventurous and oh, this would be fine, you know, maybe I'll have an hour's kit or whatever, it'd be fine. And then the sleep comes over you. And then you get to the Italian service station just outside Turin, and you just know that you're going to wake up and your car will be gassed and your wallet will be gone and the wheels will be gone. And then you're like, oh, shit, what am I going to do? I just get to France. I'll get to France. <clears throat> so I hacked it. I hacked it to France, got to France, had a couple of hours kit in the world's most uncomfortable car to sleep in, frankly. <laughs> uh, w- woke up at about sort of 5 a.m. as the sun was coming up, but it was a lovely, beautiful French service station and not like our shitty things. Had another two espressos, big bag of Harry a couple of Red Bulls, and drove all the way back and got to the Eurostart about midday and rocked up for, you know, roast chicken about half past two in the afternoon, having driven to Milan and back in one day. That was cool. That's and a, daft. That sounds cool, not daft. Yeah, it does sound cool, yeah. It was a daft, it was probably a daft decision to make the return. And you didn't get gassed? No. No. It was daft and cool. When you say gassed, what balls? do you mean? Do they gas you in your car? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like the south of France when you rent a villa, sort of yeah, yeah. Um, Jensen, allegedly. Jensen Button style. Yeah, yeah. And all allegedly. That. yeah allegedly. allegedly. Yeah. It does happen, actually. It does well, happen. Well, a lot of gas, gas you in the villa. car? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, that was what I thought. I mean, I've got no proof this shit happens, okay, yeah, but yeah. I, th- I, th- I thought it could happen. Well, Neil's got blue I, lights behind him. Neil's got blue lights behind him. He's in trouble. <laughs> blues and yeah. twos. Blues it's and roses. Oh, oh. Yeah, oh. yeah this exactly. Be- <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm going to get a bloody parking ticket, I'm sure. Bloody <laughs> Christmas. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was cool. I did 1,000 miles to both ways, so almost 2,000 miles. It's about 900 each way. So 1,800 miles in about... 27 hours or something that's quite daft i think um, quite daft. So, uh, actually what you were was you were a motoring journalist for a couple of days because that's basically what i used to do I used to wake up and just drive across europe um and i think i can't really i can't keep count of the number of daft things i've done in cars because quite often i think the the really daft behavior comes about when you've got two people normally men in a car and they get bored Yes. You and when you become bored, and you're with a mate who's a you know similarly immature individual, frankly, what happens is unrepeatable. You know, some really stupid stuff happens, and I think so, some of this I, I you know I can't incriminate other people, but I can remember you know when you're in the middle of France driving through an auto route, auto route 120 miles an hour, and someone says, right, you've got to cross your legs for the next. 10 minutes or something you know we, we it was terrible what we get up to um and we would try yeah. and you know, try and hand sandwiches to each other at 120 miles an hour and it would cause utter mayhem but i do i remember always trying to race the euro star i'd wait for a euro star 
to race. Oh. I used to love doing that because yeah. you needed. I, I was talking to the lovely James Walker of TI22, actually, who, who Neil knows. Lovely man. The other day about he's got a lovely facelift sort of 2001 blue 996 Carrera, the 3.6 litre car. They were really quick. And that was the that was the, the weakest tool for the job. You needed that or more performance to catch up with the Eurostar. So that was, you know, again, daft things that we'd do. I think um, certainly two of my old car colleagues, when they were on the Millbrook Bowl and put a Bentley, they put a Bentley Conti R at cruise control and a in the back. an hour on the fourth lane and got in the back. Yeah, so, that's mad. I mean, so, you know, there's lots of daft stuff. Can we, we do that? On. Can we do that? Can we? No, I mean, not, not tell not. anyone. Yeah, we'll give it, it, it works. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a collecting cars little road trip. Oh, there, there, there probably is. Where uh, we could do that. But, but I think what – if does anyone here listen to Cabin Pressure, the, uh, oh. the brilliant Radio 4 comedy? Oh. See, for me, what, when I first heard Cabin Pressure, for those of you that have not heard it, it's a Radio 4 comedy that had Benedict Cumberbatch and Roger Allen. It's absolutely brilliant, written by John Finnamore. It is, without a doubt, it's the, the best. best radio comedy ever written. And it's about this, this totally dysfunctional little airline that's got one plane, and there's just five of them. And they all and Douglas Douglas Richardson, played by Roger Allen, always leads the silly games. So they're either, they're either playing Simon Says or they're so you know they're not allowed to say anything to air traffic controllers. They say Simon Says first, and it's it reminded me of working at Autocar, and I just loved the daftness of it. You know, you'd be it would be how many I can remember being in a Ferrari five seven five Maranello on the south coast of France. And and the main thing that I cared about was that I had to try and get one more baby belt into my mouth. Otherwise, I lost <laughs> the challenge. I didn't give a shit about this new paddle for gearbox. But I, if I could get a 12th baby belt in my mouth, it meant that I got the polka mix next time we stopped at the service station. So I think oh, no, oh, I love I love food games. A whole bag of Maltesers in one go, that's a great game. Exactly. <laughs> whole, whole bag of Mal- exactly. And we, and we would do this endlessly, and I, I loved it. But I think in terms yeah. of out and out daftness. Uh, yeah, I think I think I, I I probably almost couldn't quote them. They're they're too silly. But I I would I would say crossing your legs at, at three figures is not the cleverest thing I've ever done. No, uh, I remember uh, you telling us that story at the uh, live podcast. I think I'm not uh, I'm not especially proud of it, but I do love I like the word daft. I, I've written down other words that we need to use. Um, queer in the in the correct sense, you're allowed to say that something's odd is queer, and also yeah. lummy. I like the word lummy. Oh. <laughs> That's a lightly shocking word. My auntie would always say, oh, lummy. Lummy, I like, I like that. that. Lummy. Right. Um, moving on. Uh, Maserati. Um, mm. Does the world still want it or need it? It's a bit of a grand statement, but uh, and a bit of a loaded question, maybe. But let's move on to Edward Lovett, who uh, probably knows more about trying to sell these things than anyone else. Go on. Um, MC20. Ghibli 4.9 SS, A6 GC by Fura, 250F by Fangio, driven by Fangio, yeah. mm. MC12 Corsa, Citroen SM, yeah. other versions of the A6 GCS by Berlinetta, Zagato, Spider. The past was just wonderful, wasn't it? It's a better place for yeah. them. I think I, the, the reason I've written those down, and, and I was selling the later iterations of Maserati when they were new, and, and the Gran Turismo when it first came out, I thought just as an automatic car was a very good car. The, yeah. the, the GTS was a great hooligans car, made an amazing noise, um, but and and it, it was a long wheelbase. It it it, it was Watch a it was a very good road car. No, no, just well, the GTS, the grand, just the normal Grand um, Grand Turismo it, GTS, yeah, yeah, yeah. Quattroporte, yeah, yeah. But yeah. and also the last of those Quattroportes of that era, GTS yeah. seven that was speed the auto. five, yeah, Quattroporte yeah. five. Yeah, yeah, they 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 were brilliant cars, but I I feel or I fear it's falling into this trap of these old brands that they're trying to now repurpose into something else. And, you know, Ferrari themselves build such wonderful cars with the prancing horse on the front that they don't need to make a cheaper version of one of those cars. They should just, if if, if there's a great car, price it as such, build it as a Ferrari. 
and there's little need for anything else. And I guess the fact they've built this pure sangue would start to suggest that they're prepared to do that um, without it needing to be the most wonderful, beautiful sports car in the world. There's what was my the last Mas- I mean, what was the last Maserati any of us wanted to buy? We thought I like that MC20. You, you, you referred to the MC20 as a bit of a parts bin car, but it's a great looking thing. I don't I, yeah. Could, yeah. I, I could happily have one of them when they've they've obviously uh taken a bit of a dip. So you know you can imagine that. Sorry, Neil, you were gonna say Well, to me it's clear if there is is if there is an Italian Jerry Jerryo. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's the Italian Jaguar. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hundred percent the same story as Jaguar, but it's got an O on the end. Jaguar O. Because it's you know, it's not been cool I uh, frankly you could say Quattro Porto, but really it's from the late sixties, early seventies. Ghibli probably I mean, I had a bit of a thing with the sort of nineties Ghibli and Shamal and all that, because Harry had one and it was all good and reading Evo. But they were they're quite shit cars, really. They are shit cars. <laughs> And I think, and I, and I think, it's always lived in the shadow of Ferrari. I think it was so detrimental to the Maserati brand that it was part of Ferrari. It's like a like a bird in a nest that doesn't get fed, and it you know the 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 mummy bird feeds all the others, feeds Ferrari, feeds Ferrari, and then it's just going to die. And that's what's happened to it. Here's a question for you, Neil. Here's a question for you. Because of what you just said there. Do you so is Maserati's, let's say, failure? I mean, it hasn't failed, but it's been failing for a while. Is that entirely linked to the success of Ferrari? So if Ferrari had been weaker, could Maserati have have flourished more? I think if 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 Maserati wasn't owned by Ferrari for such a long time, because Ferrari as a group didn't give a shit about Maserati. But actually, Ferrari I mean, it, isn't isn't it owned by Stellantis? No, it is. It is now. Yeah, yeah. It yeah, is yeah. now. But I think my my view is if it was owned by heaven forbid BMW, just like what VW have done with Lamborghini, or frankly, even if it was owned by Geely or someone, it probably would have had more investment, more effort, more time because the name. The name is good enough, right? The yeah. history is incredible. It's, but unfortunately, there's only one pasta dish. Okay, two if you include Lamborghini, you know, and 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 the third one has just not been fed, and it's died in the nest, like I, Jaguar. I, Chris will probably give the best uh, economical answer, but it just isn't economical, is it, Chris? Yeah, and and. BMW don't need to own Maserati because if you own a BMW, you want the ultimate driving machine, which is a BMW. You don't need a Maserati badge stuck on the on the front. And it's, these, it's too late these, now. These it? brands just can't survive building what they used to build because Maserati, they would have to build an electric car. They have to build an SUV. They yeah. have to build a sports car. And there's there's not enough consumers out there to buy all these cars to, no. in the volume they would need to be successful and I think or relevant. It was interesting. I think, I, I need to check this actually, and somebody will correct us, but I, I think Maserati's time in the Ferrari stable was actually quite short. Five, six years, seven, eight years? I doubt it was seven or eight years. I think it's more. Quite, quite short. Um, is, before... it, is, this, is this 3200 era... Oh. So it was basically, yeah, late night, sort of 2000. Oh, so, yeah. um, well, I, deep... I correct me if I'm wrong, but the 4200, so the kind of fixed 3200 that had the 4.2 litre normally aspirated engine, was the first Ferrari Maserati. That was the yeah, first Ferrari right. Maserati. That had a 430. Yeah. And I remember, I remember trying that down at um, Station Gar- uh, Marinello's Egham Bypass, that one, thinking that's a really nice car. And had an auto box rather than the Cambia Corso thing, and and it was just shit. It was just really, Luke, really. Luca, Luca was not going to put any effort into. No, and I, so I do think I do think there is something, Neil, in what you say that because clearly Ferrari wanted that. If Ferrari didn't want that to happen, it probably wouldn't have happened. So they must have had an initial plan, 
But then they just it just got and then it got into Fiat Chrysler. And when it sort of when Ferrari sold their stake, and now it's part of the <laughs> Stellantis thing. And there was yeah. that long period of just is it part of is it a bit like Alfa Romeo? We could go on forever about Alfa Romeo. Is it a bit like yeah. Alfa and, and Bath? And it was suddenly it was sort of a, we, we've got so many brands in Stellantis. We've got to have sort of the slightly esoteric, not very good, probably a bit shit group of Italian sporty brands, Alfa, Abarth, and Maserati. You think nothing good's going to come out of that. It's just going to be mediocre. And I looked at, I tried, I thought, can I even, no, MC20, I thought they're probably still making that. Ghibli, probably. I like I like the look of the MC20. I think it's a it very pretty car. It's it just is, a bit it's a too expensive. Bit too expensive. It's very, very pricey for what it is. Probably quite at good at the moment. <laughs> probably quite good at the moment, second hand. But the Grecali is isn't that wrestling or something? Or the Levante, isn't that Mesopotamia? You see I mean, a lot of them. Geez. In Italy, you see a lot of the four by four things, actually. That's because they're all given as company cars to senior. Yeah, probably fear, also I, I fear that if the question is, does the world still want or need it? <clears throat> the last time I thought, so yeah. About 10 years ago, when the Mark V, just before the Mark V Quattroporte got replaced, and the Grand Turismo... <laughs> and he has gone, but he'll come he's back. Gone. He'll be back. That must be the Rosers chasing him for his yeah, parking yeah. fee. He's yeah. um, the Grand Turismo was quite nice, very long, but it just... and the In fact, there's one, I, I might have missed it, there's a Grand Turismo Cabrio. Must be the longest open space on a car. Just they're good value. Place. They're they're good value. It was. I have to say, next one of those comes up I'm collecting cars. I'm going to go a little bit with my yeah, Grand Cabrio. Grand yeah. Cabrio. Grand Cabrio. I think, Cabrio, I think yeah. maybe maybe we asked the wrong question. Does the does the world want or need Maserati? I'm not sure the world. I'm not sure the current world understands Maserati, and I don't. Uh, think that's people, probably true. I don't think people even want to. At uh, yeah. uh, Goodwood this year, my pal Marino, who races lots of lovely cars that belong to Ten Tents, was racing a. Nick Mason's 250F. Now, if you go and stand next to that thing, it is, that is it, yeah. it is one of the most brilliant pieces of automotive design. It's ever. the 1950s F1 car. It's, if you ask a child to draw a car from that era, that's what they draw. That's what yeah. they draw. Uh, and I think I think it's a it's an incredibly powerful vehicle to, to look at and to hear and to see. Yeah. And, I, and I went to watch the Ferrari film. I think we'll do a separate podcast on that. Uh, last Was it last week? I can't remember. And what, what that reminded me was just this, the Ferrari Maserati rivalry was real. It was uh, pertinent to the success of, and, and actually the ultimate failure or success of both companies. They decided. Mm. They decided. They framed their success on winning the Milla Milia. Really, you know, you, you raced on Sunday or you raced that week, and then you sold on Monday. Uh, and I think I, I one of the things I didn't know as a young journalist was that actually it's quite insulting to have both those brands under the same roof. Then they're rivals. They shouldn't be yeah. run by the same company. You know, you sh they should be run by. A, it should have been bought by a rival. You know, and I, I, of course, Luca was never going to invest in it. It does. But for me, there are certain names in this world that can't. They're almost unkillable. I, th I think. I think Jaguar is a very difficult name to kill. It's just a great name for a car company. Yeah, agreed. I think, I, I think Aston Martin is a great name. For a car company, you know, you, 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 we've tried to. People have tried to kill Aston Martin for eight times. They just can't kill it. Not um, deliberately, but yes. Yeah, and I and I, I think Maserati might be the same. You know, if I if I started a if I started an electric car company tomorrow and I wanted to make something that was a little bit sporty, and I found out that the name Maserati was available for twenty million euros, it's the first thing I'd invest in. Yeah, because I just think yeah. it's a fantastic name. But the products, yeah, the products have been there. You, there he is. You say you're back. You're back. Oh, now good. You, now you look like you're. You look, it, look like it, one of those it, it, Instagram uh, uh, Instagram films where someone's at your let at your doorbell trying to steal from you, Neil. It's one of those. Oh, no, it's in, no, it's sorry, interesting. Sorry, sorry. It's interesting you say that, um, Chris. And although I think I'd like to um, agree, as someone who listed off beautiful Maseratis of the past, I think commercially. You wouldn't do it. It's a waste of money, and you you, you probably wouldn't even bother starting an electric car company tomorrow because Tesla is so far ahead. <laughs> I know, I know. But, but <laughs> well, there's something, there's something though. about that. There's something about that name. And yeah, that, and one, yeah D, there is. D, D, D Tomaso as well. I think is a great name. Well, that yeah. is sort oh, of back, lovely. 
And that's a good question. If we had to imagine, if, if, if we got to choose, and one day somebody will let us choose, if we had to choose, okay, it's down to us, you get to introduce a new Maserati, what would it be? What would we say? Well, it would it all... surely would have to fit into your life, wouldn't it? What do you need? What would you like? Well, I, you know, I've, you... I've, 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 I sound like a sad I've thought about this. I actually thought about it in the car the other day. I'm absolutely certain what it would be. Go on. Because I, if I look at it with my management hat on, of course, I don't have one of those. I'll put my management hat on now. Right. So that makes all the difference. Hat on, I'm telling you, it would be a very, very fast saloon car. And I'll tell you why. Because the whole point of this Italian bubble of cars is that we now know that they don't want to compete with each other. Ultimately, Ferrari make great sports cars and they've got the Pura Sangue. Lamborghini just make absurd cars for people that I don't understand now. So uh, Lamborghini is a brand I don't understand. They've got that Urus thing and all their sports cars are a bit of a joke. So yeah. I, I don't care if they're fast and what have you. They're, they're, I don't really take them that seriously. So I think within that, what's, what is no one in Italy making? A really good fast saloon car. So that's yeah. what I do. And I, I wouldn't do it because I was passionate about making a saloon car. I'd say, well, you, why would you take on the Urus? Look how well it sells. Why mm. would you take on their new super hypercar thing? That's going to sell like hotcakes. And all the Ferrari stuff sells out straight away for how long, we don't know. But it seems to me that, you, that what, the one thing that Maserati always did is it, they tried to make Ferrari light. They tried to make sort of diet Ferrari and it never worked because everyone just no. thought, I'd rather spend the money on the real thing. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that the last Daniel Craig Bond film, No Time to Die, that opening the pre-title scenes, man, I should be very impressed. I know what that is. Yeah. Three mm. title scenes in that No Time to Die. There's a Maserati Mark Gen 4, isn't it? With that, with that now, at the time I thought, well, now that shape and that muscular haunch. And Quattro that Porto, car, you mean? Great, great looking car. <laughs> oh, I just thought, I, I, that, I remember seeing them, I was thinking that, thinking, how good does that look? So I think some muscular, the, the pre facelift. Mark Five Quattroporte. So that would have been up to about 2010. Mate of mine had one down in Cornwall, and um, when they had the old style rear lights, the quite interesting rear lights that had proportion and stance and it oh, had muscu muscularity and and just, just imagine an Alpha Julia Quadrifoglio, but done at 250 grand, even more beautiful, twice as fast with individual rear bucket seats in Napa yeah. leather. See, that, that says Maserati to me in a way yeah. that, you know, a Lagonda yeah. or four-door Aston and or, or the Rapide never really did. Um, a Jaguar doesn't. Uh, nobody else does. Can they sell it in China or America? I don't think it'll come. Why don't no, you think, think it... Couldn't you sell it in China? I, I'm asking. I, I, I prob Probably I not. I don't know. But, but it's interesting, interesting that the UK dealers that were offered the chance to no longer have Maserati on the side of their buildings. I okay. think I think the sign the sign the sign industry was quite busy that day because everyone decided to have it <laughs> on the side of their whole buildings. town, yeah. I certainly know there was one that I used to drive past on the M4 towards Swindon. That came down quite quickly. <laughs> right, moving on. Well, my, my view of that, can I just have 30 of seconds? Course, yeah, yeah. yeah. No one which maybe is there's a reason for this, but it's the same as Jaguar conversation. No one's doing a competitor to 911. Porsche have got it all sewn up with not one competitor. Ferrari's twice the price. Why Why aren't they doing a fabulous sports car for 140 grand? Yeah, that's a fair, that's a fair point. And, and yeah. in the same way that the reason they're not building an electric car because they're fighting a losing battle. I think, I think Porsche... The 911 might be the right battle to get involved in with, with Neil. I agree with you. I think if you were sat here today thinking, I'm going to start an electric brand, I think you might as well give up. You know, China is so strong domestically. I think China is going to win that battle. Correct. If so you, you, already. You've, you've, got to, you've got to build the ultimate sports car, I, I guess, to stand any chance of, of having having the fan base needed to, to reignite the brand. But that's a... Massive call. That's Everest, isn't it's it? A, yeah, it's a it's a tough gig, but that's that's, Everest. that's the that's the only yeah. space. Lads, there. you're doing yourself down. It's a piece of piss. With these skills, we've got Neil to run the company. We've got Chris yeah. to do marketing. I can do a bit of chassis work. Edward can do. I'll do PR. No, you're doing <laughs> retail. You're doing in, you're doing interior fragrance. You know that, <laughs> right? Here we go. Um, 
Uh, it's it's the Yuletide period, and we want to discuss driving around the Christmas period. Discuss. I Do you like that. it? Do you not like it? What are the bits that you find fun? What are the bits that you find not fun? Uh, Neil Clifford. Well, I know we're trying to be very joyous and upbeat and positive about oh, Christmas, dear. but but I I bloody hate Christmas. <laughs> And and the only good thing about Christmas is because between the twenty third and about the third, because everyone's not working apart from people in my industry, the roads are empty, and it's the most joyous time to go for a drive. Yeah, Christmas Day, Boxing Day. There's no one on the road. It's beautiful. So actually, the only thing I like about Christmas is you can go for a drive and there's a lot less traffic. Um, I want to add one thing to that last point. Ten years ago, there was no traffic on the road on Christmas Day. There's now quite a lot of traffic on the road yeah. on Christmas Day. It's quite disappointing. If you if you, if you you wake up and think, oh, I'm going to go for a little squirt in my sports car, you meet <laughs> yeah. a disappointing number of cars now. Yeah. Ten years ago, it was almost on your own. But there does seem to be a lot of people moving around. Maybe it's because so many families have broken up and everyone's running between ferrying their kids to their ex or whatever it is. But there does seem to be a lot more traffic on the road on the day itself. I do think that is a big part of it. I'm sure somebody better versed in social and demographic changes in the UK and elsewhere will tell us. But I do think that. Could, and it used to be an opening window on Christmas. Well, we live, not a million miles away, but we live close to the M25. And on Christmas, when we first moved here, Christmas Day, you could open the windows in the bedroom, Christmas morning completely quiet now it's just a roar people are out on the road on christmas day yeah um that's that's me still, that's me is it you on the way yeah retail retails yeah. detail yeah. yeah never stops um yeah. but i do think what i love about it there's that sort of there's always a journey to be had there's always a journey to be had to go and see someone friends family and it's a long journey and you've got nice stuff in the car. You've got food or some gifts or just a little bit of love yep. stashed away in the boot. And I love that. And mm. there's those nice long – because they're usually quite long journeys. And that idea of a – it won't end up being a clean car at the end of a journey because the roads are a bit shit. But that nice clean car, vacuumed footwell. You can always have a vacuum footwell in a car. No excuse not to have that. In fact – if I could get away with it, my wife, Lynn, wouldn't shout at me. I'd have a little Dyson handheld cordless vacuum. Oh, cleaner. yes. Yeah, yeah. A little fitment in the boot so it didn't rattle around because that would be awful. There was a hot, but there was a Honda in the US, a seven-seat Honda that had one of those in, built it? into the side of the boot. That would be brilliant. In fact, a, a really Scott, clever thing yeah. would be a bit like some of those hotels where the vacuum's wired into the car. There's this little socket in the footwell. Yeah, well, you could plug the hose in, and the motor in the bag are somewhere else, and you could you could almost do it when you're driving along if you felt that obsessed about it. And there might be at least eight people on the planet that would give a shit. Well, I'd be one. No, of but them. you're not you're not you're not going on the M25. I get the fact that we're all driving to Granny or whatever, but if you stay off the M25, nice on Boxing Day, there's not a lot of cars there's on not, the road. There are not, few, not there are fewer cars than normal. But if I think yeah. back to the if I think back to the ultimate example of um, of when there was no traffic on the road, and this this sounds disrespectful, but it actually it comes back to a to a Christmas theme, because one of the great Christmas songs is Chris Rea's "Driving Home Christmas," which you know we all the music levels where it's simplistic and banal and what have you. But the, you know when it comes on in the car, I don't switch over the station, and I do smile a bit inside and think, well, you know. You know, good, good wood and cheer to all the other people on there. It's lovely. But Chris Rear once told me a great story. A, and he is a massive car enthusiast. He's, he's a big legend. time. Um, and he he told me that uh, he, he was being respectful, but he said he was mentioning, let's say, a, a large funeral in about 1997 for a very famous person who was part of the royal family who passed away. And he said, do you know what? There's no respect mm -hmm. to it. it. It occurred to me that might be the best time to go out and drive. And he just bought a 550 Maranello, he told me. And he said he had the best drive of his life. He said, whilst the funeral was on, he said that he didn't see another car. It's true. Um, royal, royal weddings are the yeah. best time to go yeah. for a drive. And yeah. I think yeah. that's that, that's what reminded me of Christmas. When I was younger, so when I just started driving, if I went out Christmas night, I can remember thinking to myself, 1992 when I passed my test, I won't drink over lunch. 
I won't have a glass of wine because that allow me to go driving in the evening. Yeah, I would do that the yeah. whole time because I'd, I'd go out in my, in my mini and you wouldn't see many people. So I, I, that side of it I love. However, I don't know if any of you have had to suffer this because if, if ever you are one of these people like me that spent a lot of time on motorways going up Bristol and London, when you're heading out of London Friday afternoon. Oh. He's well, gone. He he's gone. He's gone. Yeah. Or maybe he's just very static. Yeah. Or maybe he's he is out driving of out of London on a Friday afternoon. He's <laughs> he might he's have to the... leave and come back. It was gonna he's be on... a shit. It was gonna be a shit story anyway. <laughs> he was on the he was on the Hammersmith flyover by the BP service station in my head. <laughs> I didn't know is if it, he was just about to nicer? go past the last t- uh, 20 sign as you can let loose up, yes. <laughs> up by Heston uh, service stations. As it widens out. Yeah, lovely. That's a nice little bit of that. <laughs> you think it's nicer yeah. to drive into London at Christmas than out? I think there's something really nice about driving out of London. I think Christmas. anywhere you can't uh, drive... Uh, like anywhere that doesn't feel like you're escaping at the speed you want to escape at, I think it's very painful. And uh, yeah, I, I, I do it. I do it a lot at the minute. And you know, I'm not a negative person, but I'd rather be stuck in traffic than doing most other things because I'm in a car. But the traffic is a bit ropey at the minute, in and out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, L- 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 London. I don't know why with London, but at the moment there just seems like an awful lot of road works. And when when one major artery closes it just causes chaos that i don't think was even calculated and i'm, yes. I'm not sure it matters how much congestion charge or ulez is it doesn't seem to change a thing for anyone there we go yeah that's the problem Guck that's farm. The problem. yeah i tell you what i find so, quite nice at christmas is driving to a car dealership i don't know why but it just makes me feel even more warm and fuzzy and happy about my addiction to cars i don't like the car dealerships don't you no i think they've got a lot of work to do what would you change in, in terms of what what would you change about uh chris is just trying to sort his internet out what what well, do you, what do you want to feel when you walk into a car dealership the, the only one and, and and i'm not blowing smoke up your bottom um ed but the only one that i really love to walk into and maybe it's because i know the personalities is ferrari swindon yeah and i and i adore matthew and it's so sharp and everything's perfect and the the staff are smiley they're happy they're informed they're knowledgeable they're welcoming there's good coffee it's everything you want apart from that you got a bmw tring frankly try and spend 60 grand on a five series estate it's a terrible experience yeah, yeah but that's because it's been owned by umpteen different people and it's always the outlying outlying terrible member of whoever experience. Owned it. i think there's a bit of that I, I think the other thing is that a lot of these dealerships now that the design of them has been determined by the manufacturers who simply have never worked in a car dealership and um, you know, at least at Ferrari Swindon, you know, you, you, it's impossible not to get eye contact with a human being when you come into the showroom. And it, yeah. you, you go into Porsche Centre, West London, the salesmen are locked in a cupboard upstairs somewhere and no one no one wants to get eye contact with you. No one's interested. I, I, I It blows no. my mind how they... Is that, is, that because, is that because they don't need to? Because... Well, I can tell you they fucking need to now. They must do uh, now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and if I if I ran one, if I was running Porsche Centre West London, I'd move the fucking cars out of the showroom. I'd put some desks in. I'd put some desks in the showroom, <laughs> and I'd and I would I would bonus everyone on being the first person to speak to yes. a customer. We the very best salesman we had at BMW in Bristol. He he positioned his seat and and fought to have his desk in a place that he could see. He was the f- closest to the front door. And he could see every car drive in um, off the off the highway at Cribs, and he saw them get out their car and walk through the forecourt. So, and beautiful, he, beautiful. He, he just ran for them the whole time, and you know they're bone idle now, salesmen. Maybe may because what? the way they've been trained, they're all doing emails. They are doing it, yeah. But Neil, yeah. I can't, I can't get them to respond to my fucking WhatsApps. I have regardless to say, of that them, is, my, my family. That is one of the 
business, even, family even dinner, all on and family. Same thing. Even at Christmas, yeah. <laughs> when they say, "Oh, I'll get them to call you back," yeah, you know they never will. What right, moment, Chris, what, Neil, what a moment, think, so what a Neil to thinks, come back in because Eddie got potty mouth. Yeah, no, Neil. We were going to get. We were getting annoyed about car dealerships. Then um, Chris wanted to get romantic, and Neil and I threw it in the bin. Neil, yeah. so, how did we go from Christmas to car dealerships? Well, I, say, I tried to say. I think I feel quite because I'm due to have a little visit down to actually the poorer side of the road, across the the road from the Ferrari Swindon dealership, the, the lesser side of the campus. I quite like going there at Christmas because the people in there, are actually, they're very quite friendly and they might offer you a mince pie and yeah. the Christmas tree's up and it just feels, do you know what? I quite Chris, like I think, I, think, I think we're exposing the fact that we're normal citizens. We don't expect the VVIP. With a, Neil Clifford's finger is terrifying me there. Get a photograph of that. It's yeah. so it's big, big as well. God, look at the size of it. <laughs> yeah. Have you got that? Yeah, Jesus, Neil Clifford, that oh my throws goodness. your finger on the on the screen. It was terrifying. Anyway, like Chris, not to waste too much time. Neil thinks you were on the Hammersmith flyover when you froze, and I thought you're about to let rip after no. the last bit where you go up towards Heston Services. No, actually, it's not about that. It's about the fact that you you're dealing with people that don't drive very often, and they and they just don't. You know, you're not match fit. It's like flying a helicopter or whatever it is. I'm sure they're not bad drivers, but these are the ones it's exactly that sit, like that. Yeah, they sit there and they bloody sit in the middle lane at 72 miles an hour, gassing away to their other half, and they're totally oblivious to to what they're doing. And they're just they're a menace. I'm sorry. And at Christmas time, they're at their worst. You can see them. That is true. They're in their you know Tesla Model X or whatever it is that's 130 grand that gets used twice a month and just gets whacked off. Every yeah. month. And you just think, I, I just wish you weren't anywhere near me because I'm yeah. I think going to cause an accident. I don't think you're very good. So the addicts have one piece of advice for driving home for Christmas. Don't drive home for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or, or if you do, can you do it at a time of day when we don't see you? When we don't see you. <laughs> That's um, my so favourite thing to do. We were going to move on to Guide to Driving Politely. Now, this is a, it's a very short one, this. But I was out with my uh, one of my children earlier today doing a bit of... Uh, driving because he hasn't, hasn't taken his test yet and i kept saying to him you didn't say thank you to that person that waited for you and he'd say well, why don't you say thank you I'd say, oh, I'd say, oh. because because you you need to be aware of those around you that are making allowances for your driving and to make your life easier and just a little thank you i know that we can we can discuss the ins and outs of when does that stop because you can't play thank you tennis until you're all bored um but he was quite, he was quite, well, why do I need to do that? I said, because you absolutely do. It's an immutable law of the road for me. And if you don't, you're yes. the same as people that are rude to people that serve you in restaurants. I don't, I'm, I don't know. I think you should always say thank you. And, yeah. and I, I don't know where you guys feel about it, but yeah. at this time of year, how many situations that can get very, very fiery could, have, could be avoided if one just observes some basic rules of being polite to other road users? I think courtesy is this, a, is, is this a different Chris Harris? Is, is that him? Has he come back as a different person? Just because you've never said thank you to anything, anyone for anything, Ed, but don't have a go at me. Go on. I think courtesy is a gift you can pass on and it flourishes. There you go. You see? There oh, you go. lovely. There you go. And at this time of year, I've got oh. a bit of a I've got a bit of a bugbear about this one. Um, they mean well, but they're wrong. <laughs> those pe those people, Sorry. those people who, particularly down our lane, where it's sort of single carriageway and there's a passing place at the bottom of the hill and one at the top, and it's slightly over. So you've got to see if it's coming, coming up. So if you stop at the top and then flash your headlights or just turn them off and on, somebody comes up the hill and you've been waiting there and they want to say thank you. And to say thank you, they flash their lights. No. Don't like it. I can't see a fucking thing. Excuse my friend. <laughs> after that. Don't do it. What you should do, and I I did it in the passenger seat today, just little one little ping of the hazard flashes. Not well, like that's, two that's, or your, three. that's your accepted language of thank you, is it? Well, well no, you can't, it? yeah, because these days you can't turn the headlights off because no one remembers where the headlight switch is because all these automatic headlights, you know, where's the button? You never use it anymore. You just leave it on automatic. So it just comes on. 
So you, to turn the headlights off, that would be a very acceptable courtesy and spreading the politeness and goodwill at this time of year. But no one knows where that bloody thing is. It's a bit like fog lights we talked about last week. Where the hell's that switch gone? Don't, no idea. But the hazard I'm switch... I'm, 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 yeah, I, I think that's right. I think the thank you from behind... If that's such a thing, or when you're in front, but that's you're a, is, is, social social is a different podcast, Neil, that you're normally yeah. on. The thank, the, the thank you from behind. Yes, if you're doing a thank you from behind, <laughs> I don't. I don't do hazards. I do the little flick of the left and the right of the indicator. Oh, yeah. Yeah. okay. Ooh, that's, see, I think the what we've what we've happened across here is there's no accept there's no accepted general language for saying I thank you. Think Everyone's got their that. own slight quirks and they don't always resonate with other people. Like if not what Neil did there, he's, he's given a bit of a wing wave. That's a drop the left wing, drop the right wing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure I'd see that. If I didn't see that, I'd still think that oh, wanker didn't say thank you. No, you would see it. You You're would very see it. He would be, would. be Why intentional. Why you were driving a Lamborghini Espada with shit? I don't think you'd see yeah, it. Yeah, you just think he's just, he's gone just, off again. I just think he's a bit flash. Why has he painted it Bruce to green? Yeah. Or he's what's... saying, or is he saying, are my indicators going? <laughs> my indications aren't bloody going. Why is that's he? Not, why is he winking at me? Color. That guy's so a what, total. My, aren't bloody, my indicators <laughs> aren't going. Case. I'm going to flash the bastard to death. So this is now we need, okay. This is we're going, to, we're going to provide a public service here. The addicts are now going to supply the accepted thank yous yeah. and the unacceptable thank yous to when you when you're on the receiving end of goodwill from another driver. So yes. Neil, Neil's saying that he thinks a left right on the indicator is the best thing. Yeah, from from, from behind. That's love from behind. Yeah, <laughs> I've got that film somewhere. Right. Uh, 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 what do you reckon about? So flashing people is the wrong thing, but I'll no, count no. that. We, I'll count to that, Chris Cooper. What if you're driving a car or Renault from the mid noughties and you've got one of those blue windscreens? That means you can't actually see the person inside. So you quite often you can think there can be someone waving at you, going "Thank you, thank you," but you can't see them. No, so I you hate that. Think they're you a can't wave, there. particularly at night, because you're looking you're looking to the lights for some kind of signal. And somebody is gesticulating wildly in the car, getting more and more cross. A little, if you're letting somebody out at a junction, then, you know, this body language is important <coughs> as well. Stop, stop, leave a gap, make it obvious they can enter the gap that you've proffered, which is why I think, if you can remember where the headlights are, just turn them off. But if somebody's let you out, you know, if you've been let out into a road and there's somebody behind you, I do think a little one ping on the hazard flashes says, I haven't done that by mistake. I haven't done winky wanky sort of, you know, oh my goodness, I'm all. Are you just saying that you say Neil's winky wanky? No, these two live about I five agree. minutes from each other. I'm, I can imagine these two are like, they don't if, even if know Neil what and I met each there, other and they're on a fighting track the whole alone. time. Where is that winky wanky? Guy? We'd be there forever. Well, actually, we wouldn't. We'll tell you why we'd be there, because we'd be desperate to offer our courtesy to the other. No, 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 no. No, after you. Yes. Oh, that's the one. But that's the one I love. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Well, at what point, someone's got to stop the thank yous. I've got to break the, I think, the chain. I, I think it's the flash, really. I don't agree with the hazard thing. It's all, you don't know where the hazard button is. It's all a bit complicated. If you flash yeah. somebody, you blind them. I think that's discourteous. <laughs> Just not a little, not a little. A little no, fine. A, a touch, little a little touch. Yeah, but with touch. these, with these new, you know, sort of super duper laser ones, they don't just flick on a bit. They just come whammo, and they yes. stay on for a bit. And they sort of, in the old days, you could just like just just brush the thing, and half a volt of electricity would just trickle into the headlights and be yes. a little bit of a ping prick of a. But now it's just like, <laughs> bang. yeah. I can't do you think, do you think that. that's your aging peepholes that are a bit sensitive these days? And a younger Chris Cooper might be less sensitive. No, well, a younger Chris Cooper would have been less sensitive, but that's not because my eyes are going funny. <laughs> <laughs> I always think the best thing, if, you, if in doubt, if you're remotely worried, just fucking do that loads of times at the car coming towards yeah. you. <laughs> just... That would do it. That would do it. No, I, you know, I, you've, you've taken what was meant to be a very nice subject into uh, something. We've bugged that one off a bit, haven't we? I've just written here: let people in, smile at people, yep. and give thumbs up to kids and adults who look at your car and go, "Wow!" Exactly yeah. that. Exactly yeah. that. Yeah. Exactly that. And if someone wants to stop and have a chat about your car, stop and have a chat about your car. Yeah, I have to say, oh, I, yeah, say I love, I love, I love to see. The variety of people that are, that certain cars give that reaction to, and, and and when they're 
when their de- their kids are pulling on their dad's or mum's arms, wanting to point at something. I think it's such a wonderful reaction. I oh, know it's great. That saying, is true. That. I think look at talking... that gi- look at that ginger in that green Porsche. Look at yeah. <laughs> it's a ginger. <laughs> there is there is. Did you remember that years ago, Edward? When you know you were young and stylish. Oh, I'm come sure on. when I'm sure when you were in the early part of your <laughs> highly charged professional career and you were thinking for every little edge in your burgeoning commercial empire. Remember those colour me beautiful people? Remember that sort of thing a few years ago where people come along to you and they would tell you what your colours were. Remember no. that? No. It might just be colors, me. What do you mean? What, what do you mean? Do you well, they would be, when I was at Deloitte's, um, Deloitte thought the most important thing for good consulting was it was I mean, was uh, usually a young lady would come along and would look at the person and tell you what colours to wear. Now Neil, you're in the fashion business; you'll know this is probably complete nonsense. So we were told what colours we were and whether we were warm or cold, or whatever. Hmm. Am I the only person who remembers this? Uh, yes, that I was, think it was that a dream. Was a, that's that a dream a, you I had. I think they skipped over the auto car road test team. And they they might have skipped over that. That was I'm a very sure... weird woman that um, yeah. approached yeah. you to say that. Yeah, but they didn't. But, but so they never told you that slightly Titian. Should we call it, we call it Titian rather than Ginger? What? No, no. You're Tishian. on. A, you're on a different <laughs> podcast now as well. <laughs> Tishian, Look, he's a strawberry blonde, and he bloody knows it. He's isn't that, Titian the that. posh name for Ginger? He's right. happy with that. Puppy holes. He's absolutely <laughs> fine with that. Um, okay, well, I think I think we're broadly in agreement that we all like to say thank you, and that yeah. ultimately, yes. I will try because I love Neil. I will try the winky wonky. I, They'll, know from behind. You. They'll know it's you in Hertfordshire. Yeah, from behind. Okay, <laughs> okay. only from behind. <laughs> um, this being a slightly, is this a slightly shorter podcast today uh, with no manage? Sadly, um, we're going to also do our last little topic now, which won't last that long, because I, we've got to be disciplined. I've asked everyone here to name their favourite cubbyhole in a car. And you're allowed one. So, Edward, if you list seven, then then a big Monty Python-style foot's going to come down out of the top of your screen and give you a right kick on the hooter. So Fine. Well, I, I will start, but I am going to, on the proviso, <laughs> that if Neil <laughs> doesn't give the one I think he's going to, I will end <laughs> with it. Okay, you go first. Edward, you go first. So, so, so Neil doesn't jump in. So the first one is the Carrera GT sunglass holder that 99% oh, of Carrera GT owners never knew it had. Power to the people. Yeah, yeah. power to the people. Where it's is it? I don't door. even know where this is. It's it, it, It's at the top of the door. The top, on, on the, the top inside. of the door. You press it and it pops open. Oh, so it's like a Rolls-Royce pop- umbrella. Correct, but it's got a little leather pouch in the same colour as the leather of the car. That's uh, cool. For your, for your sunglasses. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Neil yeah. Clifford, have you done your, you there or not? For your stash. <laughs> is, is, Neil Clifford, have you done you there or not? No. no, no, that's not my one. That's not what? the one I oh thought. Oh, my Nick God. Uh, got... No, I'm keeping that. I'm keeping that one. Do you know how this game works, Edward? So when no, I, no, said... I told you, I told you that's my one. If Neil picks the other one or doesn't, I will be delivering that one anyway. But anyway, Neil, <laughs> Neil what's, what's your what's yours, Mister Clifford? Go on, Neil. What's yours? Well, I, I think I'm I'm definitely more down with the people. The 1987 3.2 Carrera door oh, storage box. Yeah. You've got That's mine. It. You've got it's mine. It's the best one. It's the best one. It's the best thing ever yeah, because it's, it's like a one. Tardis. You could. I'm sure you get a suitcase in it. Everything goes in it. And it's and it's also got that that sort of carpet lining on the inside. Oh, it's the best one. Oh, yeah. Neil Clifford, that's my man, you're my man crush of the day. I, I was I was thinking no one else would choose that, but for me, and also the club sport, the the club sport for lightning had the lid taken off it, so it was just literally an open space. Yeah. You could always you could get drive with your elbow sweets, in it. Sweets, chargers, extra batteries, the little thing for the Eurostar, everything, your wallet, everything goes in it. Right, I'm out of the game. So, Edward, that can stand the Crow GT. Chris Cooper. Well, I had 993 door pocket. <laughs> uh, well, it's the same bloody thing. I think it's the same thing. But, well, yeah, I, I've is, only yeah. got that because my my first 911 was a 993. And there was something about the door pocket and its feel. Yeah, it's lovely. And its engineering and its solidity and what you could put in it. And just and yeah. a little ledge on it. I just thought that was... Sounds like a really weird thing to say. 
that was the most almost the most portionous thing about it. It was just that is a, it's the same thing. It's lovely. Also, the other one thing we have to recognise is because you sat so low relative to the car you'd have owned before, it was quite high. It wasn't, it wasn't yeah. nice. down into it. You reached across from yeah. your lovely. eye and it was there. Yeah. It was just yeah. the, 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 the one Neil didn't say is the 911R sandwich holder, which for, mm -hmm. for those who don't know, but we'll put a picture up of it, hopefully. <laughs> this is going to be a little bit late tomorrow because we are recording this on a Thursday evening. Um, but for a modern car where pretty much everyone expects to see sort of gubbins or navigation systems or radios, yeah. you look at it and think, this doesn't make any... What, what, surely something should be there. It makes no fucking sense. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think that for the, the statement of it being there... Oh, no. Nothing's it's car what, in, the, in the centre... <laughs> Like yeah, yeah all, all of the, all of the cool owners of nine eleven R's don't have the stereo. Yeah, well, even with the rubber mat in the dashboard, um, the, yeah. you can't keep. If you accelerate, whatever's in there is landing on your lap straight. So, because I'm contrary, I would only buy a nine eleven R with the stereo. Oh, yeah, same shit. No, same interesting. All, all this, all this puristic. It saves two kilograms. Just go and do a big poo. You need music, don't you? Right, that's we're a big. Move on. That's we're a big gonna, poo. We're going to move on to our <laughs> two-car garage. Oh, which, oh. which references uh, Manish in his absence. So we're sorry I, I to... forgot it, but I wrote it down thirty seconds ago because I, 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 and I've nailed it. <laughs> I've not, I've not done it yet, so I'll do it on the hoof. Here we go. This is from Martin Laver four seven zero seven. How many Manish's... Martin Lavers are there? Is this the same? We had a few. Four hundred and seventy-seven, I think. Four thousand seven hundred seven. Okay. <laughs> Manish, Manish is Christmas present. After years of Manish going on about not having a fancy car, the rest of you decide to club together to get in something special. You also want to replace his current family wagon because he keeps complaining the seat fabric is looking crumpled. So you've got two hundred thousand pounds. Jesus Christ, we're generous, aren't we? I was going to say, can I be off next week? You get me something. Don't interrupt whilst we're reading out the two-car garage, Cooper. That's a yellow card. Right. Um, here we go. Uh, I'll start. I've, I've lost my flow. Uh, you, uh, you've you got two hundred thousand pounds. You also want to. So you've got two hundred thousand pounds to get him in a fast family carrier and a sporty number he can turn up to events in. But because a recent director's cut of Senna has surfaced, in which he made a derogatory comment about Ferrari, <laughs> Ferrari are now refusing to supply him with anything <laughs> from their fleet and will blacklist anyone who does. So uh, this is all hypothetical. So Manish is not blacklisted by Ferrari, far from it. Um, so we've got 200 grand to get him a fast family car and a sporty mm. number he can turn up in, but it can't be a Ferrari or anything associated with it. Off you go, Edward Lovett. So I don't think Manish has talked about this on the podcast, but he might have. So I'm going to deliver his current dream family wagon, uh, which apparently is a BMW 520i Touring. So, you know, he yep. should probably get what he asked Father Christmas for uh, Father Christmas for Christmas. <laughs> so I've, Father Christmas has got Manish what he wants for Christmas. Um, and now clearly Manish is like totally delusional and he probably doesn't need a 456M at all because he's just never found the right one. And when I look at Manish and when I see him... Mm -hmm. It's very clear the car he needs to own. He just doesn't know it yet. And I know we've all said it's a 911, but it, it really isn't. I think it's a Vanquish S, the um, previous generation Van Vanquish S. I think that is the car for Manish Pandey. It's 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 not a car for a small man, uh, for a big man, sorry. So he could fit, he could fit, he can actually use the rear seats in that car. <laughs> Um, I, I think that's a tailored interior. I think it would fit him perfectly. So, so not the VH one. So it's the sort of the DB9 derivative. Correct. The, yeah, the, the, the yeah. one that, what was it, four years ago they finished. The, the last one. Uh, yeah, Van, yeah Van Vanquish S, Norton's automatic right. gearbox. Early, brilliant, early brilliant car. No Clifford. Right. He's he's only ever had one car since he was um, born. Ever. Um, and therefore... He can't cope with different switch gears and fonts apart from Audi. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're buying in a, we're buying in, a, in a, an Audi, um, <sighs> even though he says he prefers a BMW. He'll end up buying an Audi, to be honest. Um, RS6, brand new, whatever they're bloody called, Performante or you know Special Plus Audi RS6. 
lovely chic. He's very chic, Manish. So I'd have a navy blue with tobacco, all the options, probably 110 grand or something, even though it's worth 75 but a week later. But I'd get him a, you know, I'd get him a fabulous Audi RS6 Plus, Doodah, whatever it is. And then I would, I would, um, I would get him a four, five, six. I'm collecting cars. The one owner car, I don't know, Eric Clapton's from New, because we all want to, we all want an Eric they've all Clapton. Been that. Yeah, we all want an Eric Clapton car. It's posy blue, no shields, tan, full service history. You know, there's not been any dogs in it. It doesn't smell of cigars. Um, Eric has only driven it 3,000 miles from New. Eric's, you know, so successfully didn't know how to price it. So it's 79995 You've nicked it off of Eric because he put it on piston heads. Um, and therefore, Silly Manish, man. he's, got, he's got his dream combo. Yeah. Um, I think, okay. I, right. think uh, I think that's a good combo. Chris Cooper. So when did the 520 stop being a six-cylinder? Oh, God. Well, it, there was a – they had a weird thing in the in 79 or 80 where they put a four, the five the 320 – became a no, 520 so was that in the e12 no 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 it's later than that okay. i i thought it would be it was basically the e39 was the last six cylinder 520. yes it was yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. the e the e60s were all four cylinders i thought we were right. going i thought you're going to give me a quirky one from the 70s no it's it's well it's, it's basically 2015 no 2004 2004 oh, shit, really yeah yeah. 2003. But basically. I think you'll find a 520i was still six cylinders, but a 520d was four cylinders. No, 520i, oh. E60, five, the E39, 520i was the last six cylinder 520. Was I it? didn't realize it was that far, that long ago. I remember I saying, that. I saw an F10. Comment, can you please add to the comment section? Because I've just asked Chris Cooper what his two car garage is. We're now talking about when a particular BMW went from six cylinders to four cylinders. Yeah. Because that's and, why and, we and talked and about that. And about 1,500 quid of two grand. So he's got a lot of money the left. Because the current 520 for a four cylinder car, whatever it is, 60 something, anyway, mental. Yes. So I think Neil's on the right lines here. I would have got him probably a C7 RS6, clear glass, that much more modest looking exterior, not mm -hmm. quite so brash, blah, blah, blah. And I think for his his super duper sporty number, it's got to be a McLaren. Yeah, I agree. Be with the that. Car oh, he's going to kill himself. He's going to kill himself. It's got to be the car that <laughs> Senna made most of us go wow in. It's got to be a McLaren. Zach would love him. Uh, 720S. Second hand on plexiglass. No, cars. seven twenty. I think he'd love that. <laughs> he would frighten the life out of himself. He'd love to see that. I tell you what, poor old man. He'd need a he'd need a, a lots of replacement underwear in the wet in that thing. Yeah. But um, <laughs> so I, I think we're missing it's a trick. Christmas. Here. I know, I know, and and he he should be grateful for all of these. So I, I think we're missing a trick here. First of all, I think of the new Audi RS. I agree with it has to be an Audi. I don't think yeah. just, I don't think he should cross codes. No, I think okay. he's yeah. happy with Audi. He's an Audi yeah. man, and I, and there's nothing to be ashamed of that. I think it's going to be the current RS4. The current RS4 is the dark horse of the RS range. It's a much nicer car to drive than the new RS6. Actually, if you go down a road, um, so I have an RS4, but I wouldn't have a I wouldn't have an RS4, a new one. I'd have year old, that dark blue color, clear glass, and some black leather. That's fine. <coughs> Manish. Uh, the missus and Tuco would be happy in that. But we're missing a trick here because when we think of, if we think of Manish's worlds colliding and we think of the person that, that he adores the most, that his hero, Ed Senna, he had nothing to do with Ferrari road cars. There was only one car we associate Ed, Ed Senna with as a road car, and that's the NSX. Yes. So he yeah. should have an NSXR because then every time he got in it, he could remind himself of that amazing bit of footage of Ed Senna at Suzuka driving the NSXR with the with the pedal cam showing his black slip on with a white toweling sock. And I think for me that's it's one of the most captivating pieces of road car driving footage of all. And the person that created the ultimate homage to Ayrton Senna should be driving an NSX, shouldn't he? Not a funny you, haven't, you haven't got enough money for an R though. Have you not? How much are they now? 
Oh, mm. 200 grand. 200 and, more, yeah. and, and, and more. And some. Well, yeah. given that during this last 45 an S, episodes... An NSXS, I think they did. Given, that, given that in the last 44 episodes of this podcast, each of you at some point have gone, <laughs> fuck <laughs> it, I found another 50 grand. I think for once, I'm going to allow myself <laughs> it's Christmas. an extra credit facility to get managed that. Um, yeah. Gentlemen, I'd, I'd love to have a, a, some music from you, please. Very quickly, before we ring off. Uh, let's start with Neil Clifford. I don't want to sound like Steve Wright doing dedications, but you know what? On Sunday, I drove down to the New Forest and met my friend, Robert Denton, the most beautiful man, the most biggest car addict. Follow him on Instagram, Denton Robert. He's adorable, mad, but in a brilliant way, like all of us. And I picked him up and we drove for a little coffee for a laugh because I promised him I'd do it. And we played The Chauffeur by Duran Duran. And it was wonderful. So that dead is it's a de- it's a dedication to Robert. Love it, lovely. Um, uh, Chris Cooper. Uh, we'll do a bit more Christmas next week, but you know, I I kind of a real sucker for Christmas stuff. So, uh, Wizard. I wish it could be Christmas every day. I just <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love that. The Wizard. Um, uh, Edward, love it. Now, Chris and I are self-confessed TikTok users, and obviously, like most social media. They some you sometimes get a picture or a video with a with a bit of music and you're like that's bloody good. Yeah. And anyway, this one what this one appeared four or five weeks ago, which has got me into this sort of more modern EDM thing. <laughs> and um, there was this one. There's this one track that I've been waiting to drop, and it dropped last Friday. And I was thinking with the teaser that he had. It was just brilliant. It had a real energy about it. But the actual track, shit. But I'm going to give it to you anyway, and you can make your own bloody mind up. I'm disappointed. <laughs> uh, he's he's clearly not. But it's called Found Sound, and the song's called Indigo. There's a bit in there that's very good. Um, but anyway, it'll be up oh. on the... Uh, on Found the, Sound? Uh, Found Sound and Indigo. There's a little bit in there that's really good, but most of it's crap. <laughs> um, that's a towering recommendation exactly yeah, yeah. Sa- sadly i'm uh i'm in christmas mode too so um i'm gonna be yes so contemplative time so there's lots of good stuff going on and we like to be cheerful but i'm a bit like uh neil clifford i'm not that fond of this time of year um and sometimes you need to be on your own in the car put something on that might push your buttons and push you to the point of being a little bit tearful and for me Mike and the Mechanics, The Living Years, is one where I'm oh. going, oh, oh my nice. God. And nice. I, but I think it's a lovely, lovely song. It is so a lovely song. On, listen to it. I'm going bl- to go off that way and blub. <laughs> so go on, allow yourself a bit of a cry at Christmas. You're allowed to. We're yeah. allowed to. Go on, get it all out of your system, then get that goose on. Don't buy a turkey, because turkey is shite. Buy a goose, get on with it. Cranberry sauce, a bit of gooseberry sauce. Bread and sauce. But we'll, we'll, do, we'll do a full, we'll do a Christmas podcast for you guys next week. Thank you very much. It's going to be a bit later when this arrives today. To Neil Clifford, who's incredibly generous with his time, is sitting in his Super Sports in somewhere in in London. Uh, to Edward Lover in the Clifton Girls office. To Chris Cooper in the Challenge Consulting office. To me sitting in a flat in Clifton in Bristol. Uh, and to our absent friend manager, we hope to having a good day today. Uh, uh, we'll see you next week. Oh, by the way, um, if you're looking for Christmas gifts uh, for your for your pals. Can I suggest this book called Variable Ooh, Valentines? I haven't heard of that. We should get I've, that. I've been told by my publisher, I have to remind you, because I think we want to get things going. And there's the sunglasses, <laughs> flat by Chris Harris. There they are. <laughs> You've got to buy yourself a pair of twats at some point. Yeah. Um, we'll love you and leave you. Bye-bye. Bye for now. 